So let's get started. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about those non-native insects that we all talk about as we're dealing with our plants. And I want to welcome Sam Ward, who is um, one of our forest entomologists in the Department of Entomology. And coming from my side of things, um, we have not had so much entomology support, Sam. Um, now that we have both you and Kayla, I think we're going to be spoiled, <laughs> but we'll take it for all the years that we had no forest entomologist in the college. So um, a lot of us probably brushed up a whole lot on our entomology because we didn't have uh, some folks that we could necessarily always go to. So um, this is great to have you and welcome to our Friday um, escape to the forest webinars. And with that, let me unshare this. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I see you're still muted. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to share my screen, make sure y'all can see. Can you see my title slide? Yes. Perfect. Let me hide these. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm super excited to, to be here and um, was so grateful that both Kayla and I were um, were able to be hired at roughly the same time. Um, what's that? So uh, I guess the, the first thing is I'll just provide a, a slight correction to my uh, my title slide. Just I, I know this is a seminar about woodlands, but I just wanted to clarify for anyone that was logging on in hopes of um, a presentation on on agricultural insects or something that um, now's your chance. Um, to exit. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about, um, I know this is a, a, a presentation about how Ohio gets so many, um, so many forest pests. Um, I'm going to talk about how this pattern on this slide came to be. Um, this is a, a map here of uh, non num uh, the number of, of non-native pests, so it includes both forest insects and forest pathogens. Um, and I'm going to talk about this broad pattern and how the things that that have essentially come together to to produce this pattern. And so it won't be entirely focused on the state of Ohio, but certainly the themes and processes that I'm going to cover um, have led to invasions in Ohio. Um, and generally speaking, when we look at the distribution of of forest pests in the continental United States, well, and Alaska here on this, uh, the, the point of this map and the point of this paper was that you see this highly aggregated distribution here in the northeastern part of the U.S. Um, and that um, uh, you know, does, as you look at this map, start to bleed over into Ohio. So this, uh, this paper here and, and this data set, um, this was published in uh, 2013. Um, so um, I, I, I don't think I said this, but um, you can tell from looking at the map, you know, these darker colors are where you have more, more non-native insects and pathogens. So it's published in 2013. Um, so that means that you, you're missing a few things that um, some of you um, are uh, probably aware of. If not, I'm glad to make you aware of them. Um, things that have showed up in this state, um, a couple of them since I've started here. I've just been at Ohio State since July. Um, so they, they probably showed up prior to, to me showing up here, but um, in terms of our knowledge about where they are in the state, that's really, um, really grown and, and, and gotten on our radar since I, I was hired, which has been like drinking from a, a fire hose trying to work on invasive species in the state of Ohio, which um, in, I guess is equal parts um, exciting and equal parts, I guess, somewhat sad and depressing. So um, I'm just showing you a couple of pictures here of things that showed up this summer. Um, in terms of box tree moth and elm zigzag sawfly, um, and then spotted lanternfly, which has been here for um, not just this summer, but a, um, at least a year or two now, uh, but is certainly uh, getting a stronger foothold in the state. And so I wanted to, to mention this, uh, just uh, give a, a plug for uh, one website here, one app, that if you do see these things, please do report them. Um, you can go to this link, download a, an app on your smartphone and report new detections of um, invading species. So um, these things are not, these insects are not going to be included on this map because they're established in the U.S. after 2013, or at least that's the, when they were detected. And um, this map right here is also not going to include things that have spread from, uh, for instance, the south or the, the northeast into Ohio. 
since 2013. So it's not an updated map. Um, to that end, though, I've added this link here. Uh, so if you're if you like maps um, and or invasive species and you like to geek out about these things like I do, um, you can go to this link and it will take you to uh, this Alien Forest Pest Explorer website. So if you were to click on, I'm not going to go through all the links here, but if you were to click on pest detection by county, it would take you to this map, which um, will look somewhat familiar to the map that I just showed you. It's the same exact database. It's just been updated a bit. Um, a couple of things uh, you, you might notice if you've been looking closely at the numbers is that um, that previous map went from uh, three to 45 species. So this updated one, and so some corrections here, uh, it goes up to 42 in the most high, highly invaded counties um, presented in blue and then down to zero um, into areas like the Great Plains and stuff where you don't have as many forests and by extension or as many trees and by extension as many uh, non-native forest pests. So uh, one fun thing you can do with this map is you can um, or this this website is you can pick a pest. I'm just going to choose spotted lanternfly um, and then you can zoom in and see the um, uh, the distribution, current distribution of this insect. I um, mean, you can do this for the 90 or so um, insects and pathogens that are in this database. Uh, this, as you're looking at this, especially a lot of people um, from Ohio are, are on this webinar, you're going to say, hey, this isn't quite updated. So there is a lag here in terms of detection and reporting. But uh, if you do, you know, if you're looking at some of these these insects and pathogens on this map or on this 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 website and you find, uh, you know, hey, that's actually in my county. Um, I know they would love to hear from you. I'm actually working with with Kayla um, and uh, Sandy Leopold, who was the author of that that paper of the that um, like pretty orange and purple map that I showed you um, to try and do our best to uh, uh, increase the accuracy and update this database for um, the region nine, so the Northeast region and upper Midwest. So if you do know, if you're looking at these maps and you say, actually, we have that insect um, or pathogen, please do report it. Um, so uh, another thing that uh, you can do with this map um, is you can zoom in. And, and so what I'm going to show you is an example here of the most heavily invaded county in Ohio. So if you were to click on this, um, it would come up as Wayne County, so um, I don't know if this is like a, a badge of honor or something just to be, I guess, slightly depressed about, but um, you can look at Wayne County and you can look at all of the uh, pest species that are detected there. Um, so everything from beech leaf disease and pathogens, chestnut blight, some more historical invaders to um, some recent ones to more historical ones. So uh, what I'm going to do is walk you through, as I've mentioned, um, the factors that have resulted in this uh, pattern of invasions in the United States. Um, I'm going to do that by talking about some um, other people's works, some, some very kind of foundational papers in these processes, and then also some stuff that my lab has done um, in the last few years. So when you think about uh, how non-native insects and pathogens um, become established, um, globalization is going to be uh, a, a major, major driver. So I'm showing you uh, some work here by uh, Sandy Leopold and colleagues with number of species. Um, and this is showing the invasion pathway uh, that they these different feeding guilds are most likely to arrive on. So what this is telling you is that depending on um, the insect's life history, whether it feeds on the foliage or feeds on, uh, on phloem inside of the tree, that really dictates how it's going to arrive in the U.S. or any other country via an invasion pathway. So things like uh, sap feeders and foliage feeders, um, here is depicted in green, they're going to likely show up or be most likely to show up on imported live plants. Um, and some recent work has shown that um, really the, the importation and planting of live Live plants has been a major driver of global invasion patterns. And uh, the other things that you see here are hitchhiking. So these are going to be things um, like we saw a photo before I started of spongy moth. Um, so organisms that um, affix their egg masses to uh, human-made objects, shipping containers, ships, that sort of thing that um, are not really transported on a live plant or in wood packaging or something, but arrive via that mechanism. Um, so, of course, I have a picture of boxwoods, boxwoods here. Um, that would be a good example of something that got planted. Um, and then we've had lots of non-native insects and pathogens that have showed up on boxwood that uh, 
presumably would not be here with without the planting of boxwood, given that um, things like boxwood um, boxwood moth doesn't have uh, native hosts that occur outside of this this planting in in uh, the United States or this uh, planting of boxwoods in the United States. So, uh, and the other uh, thing I wanted to point out about this graph here is that you have wood and phloem feeders that are by and large going to show up on wood and wood packaging. And so uh, when, when you're thinking about uh, invasions and how things are able to arrive, um, so that's sort of the first step in an organism being able to invade. Um, and in order, once you've arrived, you need to establish. And a major determinant of establishment is something called propagable pressure. So essentially the number of individuals in a given species that have arrived at a certain location at a certain time. And uh, this is a graph here depicting that this relationship here uh, holds for several different taxa. I won't go into all of the details um, of this work, but essentially a propagable pressure here on the x-axis. So here's more individuals arriving at a given, uh, of a given species at a certain location in time. Here are fewer. And then you have their ability to, or their likelihood of establishment. So you get more species arriving, you have a greater chance of establishment. Or sorry, you get more individuals of a species arriving, you get a greater chance of establishment. So um, what we wanted to do was not, um, not so th this relationship here is very well characterized. So we, we weren't, uh, but we were interested in trying to determine what factors drive propagable pressure in the first place. Because there's actually, um, as I've showed you, you know, we know a lot about the different pathways through which an organism will arrive in places like the US or where they don't occur, but we don't know a lot about what factors that govern their entry into those invasion pathways. And so what we wanted to do um, was to uh, essentially try and explain what drives variation in entry into invasion pathways. So to first do that, we needed to get data on actual propagals. So what we did is we extracted data from that's compiled by USDA APHIS. Uh, so this, these are in, involving, you know, you get a shipping container that shows up, you open it up, um, uh, USDA APHIS border specialists, they're going to look at the wood packaging uh, material, see if they detect anything and then record that as an interception. Um, so we are, we're looking at interception data over a long period of time and I'll, I'll show the data here in a few slides. Um, but these data uh, do come with some problems. Um, in that uh, only a small portion of cargo is inspected annually. Of course, that's not by choice. Um, that's just there's so much that gets imported. It's difficult um, to actually inspect everything that comes in. I think the, the most recent estimate that, that's coming to mind is like less than 2% of the wood packaging that gets imported actually gets looked at. Um, so we're only getting a small snapshot of, of what is arriving in wood packaging. Um, it's not a true random sample. So this is for a variety of reasons. So uh, depending on the person that's doing the inspections, they might have uh, either a slight bias towards looking at a certain pathway, um, and that bias might come from uh, actual policies that say, hey, you know, imports from this country pose a greater risk because of X, Y, and Z, and so they're more likely to inspect that pathway, um, or it could be de-emphasizing a pathway. Um, uh, there's a, uh, uh, there was a I'm blanking on the person's name, but essentially like 30 or so, 40 or so years ago, there was um, sort of a finding that said that actually wood borers and uh, and bark beetles and stuff getting imported doesn't pose a really serious risk. Um, and at the time, it actually looked like a good decision to make uh, based on the historical data. Of course, now in hindsight, we know that was probably not a, a, an accurate conclusion, um, but you actually see that show up in the interception data where the, the interceptions of bark and woodborne beetles just kind of really tapers off. And it's not because they weren't arriving, it's just we decided it wasn't super necessary to look for them. Um, and then I also want to mention that interceptions are reported as events. So um, you'll get Yes, there was an interception this year, but that could have been a single individual or it could have been dozens in an infested log or something or an, an individual piece of wood packaging material. Uh, and then I'll also mention that not every species gets uh, inter not every species that shows up in the interception data has become established. And we also have species that have invaded in places that never show up in the interception records. 
So that's to say, summary of this is that this information is slightly imperfect, um, but um, this is work by Brokerhoff and colleagues um, using this same inspection data that I'm going to uh, show you here in a few moments, um, that the more frequently a given species is intercepted, the more likely it is to become established. So this is uh, uh, what I want you to take away, or I'm hoping you'll take away from this, is that uh, this interception data, despite those problems that I outlined, do provide some useful insights into propagable pressure. So our objective with these data uh, was to determine if an insect's abundance in its native range corresponds to changes in its arrival rates. So to explain the logic a bit, um, in the extreme case, if you think about um, the abundance or um, or damage of an insect, if that if that is zero, if the abundance goes to zero and an insect is for some reason goes extinct in its native range, that really poses then no risk for that insect to invade from its native range. Of course, that's an extreme example, um, but we were more interested in this part of this relationship where if you do get an increase in abundance um, or an increase in damage from an insect, which would in theory, be associated with its abundance, um, do they start to show up in the international invasion pathways more often? And from an applied perspective, we were interested in this because, uh, you know, if you said, hey, we're getting an increase outbreaks from this insect, you might be able to say, well, let's, you know, increase our biosecurity practices against that given species um, in response. So to look at this question, we used a uh, European spruce bark beetle, uh, Ips typographus. It's a, a beetle, so it's in the order Coleoptera, and it's in the family Curculionidae, so the family that also includes weevils. Um, and we use this insect for a variety of reasons that I'll, that I'll outline. So one is that it, it goes through these uh, giant episodic outbreaks. Um, uh, it's native to Europe, so it, it's often following um, uh, like windstorms. You get a lot of trees that get blown down, and then the populations build up and can, and can outbreak. Uh, so it, it's a it's a, a pest species um, in Europe, and actually, if you're familiar with the early detection rapid response uh, program that's administered by the the trapping program administered by the Forest Service, um, this is actually like a main focal species of that trapping program. So it's a major species of concern, um, and uh, as I mentioned, it goes through these large scale outbreaks. So uh, the and the, the point of this slide is that not only does it go through these outbreaks, but they're pretty well tracked in terms of data availability in a lot of different locations. Um, so um, this, this work that I'm describing, we were actually were, um, it was very kind of Lorenzo Marini. He's a, a co-author on this work, but he, he shared these abundance data for Ips typographus. So these are just time series of um, each one of these panels in a different location represented up here on the dots in Europe, um, showing the volume of timber loss uh, per year. And so the, the main host for this, as the name suggests, um, um, are spruce species. So um, so this is essentially volume of spruce trees killed in Europe through time. So we extracted this data. Uh, so we had our sort of metric of abundance at this stage. Um, and the other thing, and this is um, somewhat alarming, and I'll, I'll say this a few times just to drive the point home, is that this insect is not known to occur in the US. We don't have it here to the best of our knowledge, um, but it is intercepted frequently. So this is looking at the same interception data that I'm presenting on right now. Uh, and in the US, about one in 10 interceptions historically, at least prior to, to, to 2000 or so, were Ips typographus. So it was intercepted, it, it was intercepted very, very frequently, which I'll, I'll show you data on that in a moment. So uh, we have outbreak data in the native range. We have good interception data for Ips typographus. Um, and then when you think about um, its risk to the US, we have a lot of Picea species. Um, this is uh, native Picea species here on the left and on the right, Picea abies, which would be the preferred major host for this insect in its native range. Um, this is not a map of everywhere that it occurs. It is widely planted, uh, but this is uh, sort of a suggested or, or you know, suitable places where you could plant this tree. Um, this is a, a, his, uh, a historical paper. I'm not sure you know, how well the tree would do in the Southwest now and stuff, but nonetheless, it, it does get planted on our landscapes pretty frequently. So that's to say that if it were to arrive, um, it does appear to have suitable hosts. So that's a major component when you're thinking about invasions by forest insects, that they need to have a suitable host after they arrive. 
Um, and the other thing is that the climate needs to be suitable for them to persist. And so this is some, some climate modeling here uh, done by uh, Kishan Simbaraju. And the redder areas are going to show more climatically suitable regions. And as you move into the cooler, uh, the, the cooler scale, part of the scale shows that it's not suitable. So uh, not only do we have a lot of hosts in these regions, but the climate appears to be highly suitable for its typographs. So that's to say that if it were to um, arrive and exit a wood packaging material, if that was the mechanism for its arrival, it would have a suitable climate and hosts in theory, depending on where that emergence occurred in the US. So uh, what I'm gonna show you now is just some snapshots of the raw data. So here you have the number of interceptions on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you just have year. And so as a reminder, each one of these, um, I'll, I'll use this one here. So this is uh, 13 or 14 interceptions that in theory could only be 13 individuals or it could be hundreds of individuals represented here. So this is just the number of interception events. So uh, first detected it, the interception data go back to about 1914. So we first detected it in the 19, late 1930s, uh, didn't detect it for a while despite ongoing inspections, uh, had quite a few in the 1940s, um, some isolated incidents in, through the 60s and 70s, and then you got tons and tons of interceptions here. Um, this decrease might here, uh, I think probably reflects that de-emphasizing of the wood packaging pathway that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and then you got this, this decrease here in interceptions into the, uh, into the early 2000s. And our, this data end about 2008. I will mention that we've looked at the data that, that go out further um, into 2018 or so, and it's been intercepted, I think fewer than 10 times across that span. So I think this, this decrease here and, and it remaining low uh, I'll talk about this later on in more detail, but I think it's it's indicative of increased uh, sanitation of wood packaging material. So the material getting heat treated or chemically treated and debarked before it can be used as wood packaging. So that's going to reduce the um, survivorship of insects in, in uh, that wood packaging pathway, which is sort of some good news. You don't always get to talk about good news when you're uh, presenting on in, invading species or potentially invading species, but in this case, um, that's one bit of good news, that it appears that those interceptions have gone way down and have remained low. So uh, to refocus, we were looking at trying to explain variation in these arrival rates. So uh, I've mentioned that so policy is going to drive some of the patterns of those interceptions, de-emphasizing the wood, wood packaging pathway and that sort of thing. So what we did to account for that is we took the interceptions for all of the scolatine species, so members of the same subfamily for this insect, um, and we just divided the interceptions of Ips typographis by those total interceptions, um, and we got what I'll refer to as standardized interceptions. Um, so you'll see that in some years, this is basically saying back in the 1940s, and this year it was over 10% of the scolatines intercepted were Ips typographis, um, and interestingly, you still see this decrease um, so what this is showing is that even after correcting for the interceptions of all scolatines, it seems like relative to all the other scolatines, Ips typographis interceptions seemingly are going lower and lower than other species. So that's a, uh, a bit of good news for this potentially, um, what, would, what people believe would be a highly damaging invader if it were to establish in the U.S. So uh, when you look at this data, I think, I, I can't remember the exact year that, that APHIS was established, but um, basically a lot of these older records come from uh, like looking through um, like paper reports of, of interceptions and stuff. And then once um, APHIS was established, there was sort of higher quality information recorded about interception events. Um, so they would record things like uh, where the where the shipment on the interception had come from, the time of year, uh, where exactly it was intercepted. Whereas prior to this um, highlighted area, you would get just uh, like a list of 20 interceptions and then a list of 10 countries where those came from, and you wouldn't know how to pair those things together. So I say all that because when we're going to look at trying to explain variation in these standardized interceptions, uh, we wanted to be able to link uh, 
where the interceptions were coming from with the actual countries that had outbreaks and imports from those countries. So we needed higher resolution information on the interceptions themselves. So we only analyzed this sliver of the data here from 1985 to 2008. Um, and we, I'm going to show you um, a statistical model here. Um, it's just going to be in pictures. Um, so basically, we're um, looking at the explanatory uh, power of the um, timber loss in Central Europe and then imports from Central Europe, the ability of these two things to explain variation in interception rates. Um, so basically, if, if there's an outbreak and or if there's higher imports from that region, do we get Ips typographis? Um, and unfortunately, I, I'm not even going to show you the results from this beyond just telling you that there is uh, nothing that even remotely resembled a signal that these things correspond to each other. So it was kind of a, um, a bit of a bummer to find out that, uh, you know, you can't sort of, at least for this individual species, uh, you can't use these changes in import volumes or changes in outbreaks to um, infer anything about its risk of invading. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more of the nuances here as to why we think those things don't correspond to each other. So uh, this is just data from 1985 to 2008 for Ips typographis. This is uh, Central Europe here. So uh, what I'll point out is that you have Italy being the, by far and away, the major contributor of Ips typographis, even though Italy doesn't have a ton of spruce. Uh, the reason for that is that we import a lot of tiles from Italy, or at least this is our, our, our explanation and the, the best one we have for why we saw this pattern and why we see Italy showing up so much is that we import a lot of tiles from Italy, um, and there are a lot of wood packaging associated with those shipments, um, and they use a lot of spruce in that wood packaging. And so um, even though you don't get a lot of outbreaks of Ips typographis in Italy, you still get a lot of interceptions. So that was sort of um, reduced any effect of outbreaks for explaining variations um, in interception rates. So uh, this is uh, so this is showing you this pattern across space to look at it. Um, I'll show you it just kind of a snapshot here of by country. Again, you're seeing that Italy uh, shows up the most often in terms of uh, sending us Ips typographis most frequently. But when you look at it through time, so this is the total interceptions of Ips typographis as a function of year. Um, and the colors on this bottom graph correspond to the colors on the top graph. So this light blue are interceptions from Italy. Um, and this kind of highlights, um, I guess, I, I was struck by, I guess, just how hard it can be to predict who's going to sh ship you an insect, in this case, it's typographis in a given year. Um, you know, Italy is pretty constant uh, through time in sending us it's typographis each year, which makes sense is kind of the the number one exporter. Uh, but then you have uh, places like Russia that showed up for five to six years in the 1990s. Uh, you have a place like Romania that showed up in one year and sent us a bunch. Um, and then you have places like Poland that just showed up in two years. So it's kind of these um, uh, exceedingly difficult to predict sources of Ips typographis. And I think that this pattern probably um, and evidence would suggest that it, it holds for a lot of species that um, that arrive uh, via international shipping. So this is where those interceptions originated from. Um, I do want to mention that uh, one random thing that you I just find this kind of fascinating. Uh, but the one thing you find when you look at the interception data is you'll get interceptions from places that the insect like definitely does not uh, occur in. So you'll get like a, a shipment from. Um, uh, I can't think of an example for Ips typographis uh, off the top of my head, but you, you get it for like a shipment from South Africa or something and say, okay, look, we got Ips typographis, but it's definitely not there. And it's because South Africa would import something from Italy and then they would take and reuse the wood packaging material and then export it to us. So you'd see this interception show up as coming from South Africa, but it would be sort of nonsensical in terms of the actual distribution of the insects. You kind of get these weird patterns that show up in the interception data. Um, so this is where things come from. When you look at where they're arriving in the U.S., um, you get these warmer or hotter red areas are going to be the most frequently um, states that have the most frequent um, interceptions of Ips typographis. And then, you know, if, if there's a state that's colored in white, we've never had an interception reported there. 
And then the numbers represent the number of interceptions per state. So, uh, and I'll just quickly point out what these yellow dots mean. So uh, again, this insect is not known to occur in the United States. However, it has been detected three different times in traps. So uh, when I'm talking about interceptions, again, I'm talking about things that are found during inspections at ports, but um, these three yellow dots are instances in which the insect has made it through the pathway, emerged from wood packaging material, presumably, and found its way into a trap. So um, I think the most recent trap was in like the early 2000s. Um, I think I, I want to say in Maryland, uh, but hasn't been trapped since, not known to occur here. So that's some good news. So when I first looked at this map, I was somewhat encouraged in that I, uh, if you remember back to where the Picea species are going to be located um, in the United States, it's mostly in the Pacific Northwest and in the Northeast. And so when you're getting most of the arrivals happening for this species, uh, they're happening in the, so uh, the Southeast. So that's good news. Um, but uh, there's sort of two problems with uh, being too excited about that. And that is that one, this, this insect can, in certain situations, uh, develop on pine species. And there's, of course, a ton of pine across the southeastern U.S. Um, and the other um, the other thing that uh, one needs to consider when looking at this is that, yes, these are where the interceptions have occurred, uh, but you can have these things are, you know, the wood packaging material is going to be uh, frequently inside containerized cargo that then gets put on a truck and gets driven to, you know, the middle of the country or or something, or could be driven all the way up to the Pacific Northwest. So uh, that's to say that where these interceptions occur are not actually where the insect will have the opportunity to emerge from wood packaging and then leave a container, since we're only really inspecting, uh, as I mentioned, a, a very small fraction of the wood packaging material that arrives. Uh, one thing that um, that I was really encouraged by and intrigued by was this clear seasonality to interceptions. So here we just have the total number of interceptions across the entire time period that we studied, and then these are months, so January, February, March, and so on. And what you find out that most of these interceptions are occurring uh, during winter, uh, and then you get this drop-off during spring into summer, and then you get, again, a pickup into late autumn into winter again. And uh, my explanation for this is that you, during this time of year, you're going to have a lot more beetle flight. So if they're, uh, they're not going to be in their immature stages as often as they certainly will be during those colder times of the year in Europe. So basically, if they're, you know, whether it's them moving in the container or before they get put into um, milled down and used as wood packaging material, a lot of the brood, the insect's offspring, will have emerged from that material. Um, and so to, to summarize, summarize this, this first part of the talk, uh, basically the outbreaks for this insect, um, the outbreaks in the native range and the import volume from that area don't correspond to changes in interceptions. Uh, but uh, something about seasonal abundance seems to be able to explain changes in arrival rates or biosecurity risks. And this is actually something that my lab is trying to dive further into currently at Ohio State. Uh, to, to figure out how, depending on where an insect leaves from and where it's going um, and the given species it is and the time of year, if you'll be able to put those things together, for example, to say, well, actually, if you have an insect that leaves Europe in July and it's this species, there's probably very little chance it'll, you know, emerge after arriving in the U.S. from wood packaging material. We expect it to arrive in, or emerge in transit or something. And the idea there is that Inspections are such a resource limited undertaking, um, you know, being only being able to inspect so much of all of the cargo that comes in that if we can kind of fine tune, fine tune when we ins inspect materials, we might be able to increase our chances of intercepting something um, and have it further serve as a deterrent to um, other countries from either exporting things to us or, or taking extra measures in their sanitation practices at a given time of year. So I've been talking about how things get to uh, a given location about arrival. I'm gonna move into talking about establishment. So if you think back to that map that I showed you um, on the, the second or third slide of the presentation, 
Um, that was for all of the non-native insects and pathogens that have established in the U.S. Um, non-native forest insects and pathogens that have established in the U.S. And this is uh, the locations of their first discovery. So um, nothing about where they occur now, uh, but just where the first report for where we found them in the U.S. Um, so what we wanted to do was look at this data and figure out if we can explain where these points, uh, identify factors that sort of drive the aggregation of these points. Um, and so to do that, we used a, a modeling tool called spatial point process modeling, and, and I'll walk you through um, how, how that works in, in detail. So if you kind of think about each one of these points as being like a piece of chocolate, like an M&M or something, and you were to hold up a, a, a heater to it and you were to melt them, you would get higher density of chocolate in areas where there's lots of M&Ms. Um, and so that's what this map is kind of showing you here that, um, and you can visually see it when you look that there's lots of concentration of points in the Northeast um, with fewer spread in other parts of the country. So you can then uh, sample from this surface and get an estimate of the expected, and that's what's shown on this scale, the expected detections per square kilometer. So you can also do that same process with um, predictor variables. So you could imagine each one of these being a piece of chocolate, doing an interpolation is what it's called, um, and getting an estimate for human population density across this entire spatial surface being the contiguous US, um, and then looking at how those things correspond to one another. You can also uh, do this with latitudinal and longitudinal patterns. So to figure out how just those concentration of first discovery points change through time. So. Um, I'm going to jump to the results, and I'll I'll walk you through um, I'll walk you through my interpretation of them and kind of what they mean. So uh, we found that human population density, interestingly, didn't seem to explain any variation in the density of those first discovery points. We did leave it in the model uh, because uh, sort of as a representation of of survey bias. So generally speaking, if you have more people in a given area there's a greater likelihood that you're going to be able to detect, uh, you're going to be able to detect species and report them. Uh, so we left it in the model, but what we found is that these, uh, these proxies for commerce and for the movement of insects is actually a greater, has greater explanatory power for where we find new establishments. Um, so where there's more ports, you get a higher concentration of points. And where there's a higher density of roads, you get a higher concentrations of those first discovery points. I'll jump down here to these. Uh, this would be a, a, lati a latitudinal trend. We didn't find anything, so there's not a higher concentration at, um, uh, at more southern latitudes than there is at more northern latitudes in the U.S., um, but I'll walk you through this longitudinal pattern, this west-east gradient. So if you're looking at this map, what, this, um, what these results are showing you that if, if I were to sort of push it back into the screen, this uh, first positive association here moving west to east is showing you, and you can look at the map and guess this visually, the statistics are just showing that, that you get a higher concentration of points in the eastern part of the United States. Um, and that makes sense when you think about kind of how commerce developed in the country and having higher population density in the northeast historically. Um, you maybe would have guessed this pattern before I showed you these results. Um, and then this, uh, this squared term here is essentially showing you that you're getting a higher concentration of points on the coast. Um, that's because that's where a lot of the ports are, and it's also where a lot of the people are. So in some ways, this is um, uh, really sort of uh, confirming uh, an analysis just to confirm what I think, you know, many of you on the webinar probably would have guessed that, uh, you know, we, we have areas of commerce driving invasions, and we have uh, concentrations of these first discovery points happening in coastal areas where there's a lot of people and a lot of commerce. So uh, in each one of these points, um, we could get extra information. So I'll, I'll use uh, perhaps, maybe not today, but certainly historically in Ohio, public enemy number one in Emerald Ash Borer. Um, at least in terms of forest insects. Uh, so we know something about this insect and in that it was discovered in 2002. And it's a wood borer. So what you can do is use uh, what's called marked point process analyses. 
uh, to look at how these different groupings, like time of discovery or its feeding guild, like borers versus sap eaters, and how that changes where species first arrive in the U.S. So uh, what we did to look at this for time is we grouped the data into four different time periods. The time periods aren't the same length, but there's equal representation of species in each of these time periods. So there's 19 to 20 species for each one of these intervals. And what I'm going to do is just show you species that are in the first interval. And I'm going to like cherry pick some of the more exciting results here, but I, and I'm going to do it just by showing you maps. Uh, but I will say that we've done the statistics underlying these things that show that the patterns I'm describing are uh, statistically clear. So in this case, um, you'll see that most of these uh, most of these points are concentrated in the northeast or points uh, are concentrated in really heavily populated areas out west in California. So these would just be uh, forest insects and pathogens that were discovered prior to 1907. If you jump forward to the most recent, you'll notice that this, these points tend to be much further spread out and less aggregated. And we attribute this to, jumping back a slide here, you know, here you have sort of commerce being concentrated in these areas, but as time goes on and you get two things going on, you get increased commerce in different parts of the country um, in more inland locations, and you also get the proliferation of containerized cargo. So, you know, you get more and more shipping containers that use more and more wood packaging. So that's going to facilitate the movement into uh, inland parts of the country from those ports where things are first arriving. Um, so I think that that's, this kind of reflects um, a bit about what we know about globalization and, um, and how those patterns have changed through time. So, and you'll kind of see this um, when uh, looking at guilds, which I'll, I'll walk you through right now. So, um, this is uh, just the data for sap feeders, so things like hemlock woolly adelgid would be included on this. Uh, and this is showing you that you have a concentration of points now in coastal areas. So I think this reflects, uh, if you think back to some of the earlier slides where live plants are going to be the major driver of arrival for uh, major driver of, of, of arrival for sap feeders, um, and they're arriving in a port. Uh, they're probably going to have a greater likelihood compared to borers, borers, which I'll show in a second, of sort of spilling over into the immediate vicinity and colonizing plants near ports because they're going to be, you know, on a live plant potentially um, and, and then able to disperse and they don't have to exit from a, uh, a shipping container. When you look at borers, you see again this uh, sort of more random spread out pattern. And again, I think this reflects our ability to um, move insects from the, or in particular, insects residing in wood packaging from the port where they first arrive. If that's not open, if the container is not opened and inspected, they can get drived inland and established in, in a more inland location. So um, I'm going to show you a graph now of a time series of the accumulation of these different guilds of insects. And this is, um, I'm showing this for a few reasons I'll explain, but one, is that um, so here we have cumulative pest detections on the y-axis as a function of time. Here, this is showing you, um, you know, as you get more containerized cargo here, this these dots here represent phloem and wood borers. So you have this really striking um, apparent increase in the accumulation of wood borers with increased use of containerized cargo relative to some of these, these tapering off of things like sap feeders and foliage feeders. So that's one reason I wanted to show this graph. Um, the other one is that um, this is uh, setting the stage for something that my lab is working on right now. Um, so this is data, as the, the figure here says, by Alkema, Julianne Alkema et al., looking at the historical accumulation of forest pests for the continental United States. So what we wanted to do was look at historical accumulation for uh, phloem and wood borers, uh, but just not compiling this data for the US, because as you can see here, it's pretty well compiled. We wanted to do it for every single country on Earth. And so that's a quite an undertaking, but we, uh, so I guess to make it slightly easier, rather than focusing on all wood borers, we focused on scolatines. So that's going to not include things like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, which are buprested, uh, buprested in a serum bisid, so an entirely different family. 
So we focused on the Curculionidae um, and specifically Scolatini, a subfamily of the Curculionidae. And I'm uh, just cherry picking a few uh, few species here that uh, have invaded somewhere and that are in our data, um, just to show you kind of their morphology and what they look like. A lot of them are very, very tiny insects. People often say they're this, you know, for many species, smaller than a grain of rice. Some of them are much tinier than that. Um, they have a really cool, they have really cool life history. I've sort of like uh, fallen in love with them as I worked more and more with them. Um, and there's uh, lots of great work going on in the U.S. So if you're, if this is something you get in, really globally, but if you get interested in it, there's plenty of resources out there to read more about these. Uh, but generally speaking, um, their life history is such that uh, depending on their tax or ecology, they will um, attack a tree, um, signal to members of the same species that they're doing so, and uh, then attack the tree en masse, overcome its defenses, and then uh, lay their offspring uh, and have that brood develop in the phloem. Um, there's also uh, members of this subfamily, like the ambrosia beetles, that will colonize a tree, but actually inoculate the tree with uh, an obligate fungal symbiont um, that then they feed on and their offspring feed on. So actually they're not feeding directly on the tree, they're um, farming fungus, which is uh, really cool. So, uh, so we collected data on the scolatines that have invaded each country on earth. And we did that for, uh, and, and while recording that data, so we had you know, the, species that, the species that was invading and then the year it was first detected. Um, I want to provide a, a, a caveat here, since this is a, a lot of data. This is a, some, or a lot of data that we attempted to compile. This is a, uh, I fed in a garbage in, garbage out in statistics into a uh, an, an AI image generator and got, if, if any of this makes sense to anyone on the left, please send me an email, let me know. Uh, but it kind of just spit out things that I think look like maybe Russian propaganda or something. Um, but I did this to, to make the point that when you're compiling data for this number of species over the period of time we looked at for this many countries, um, there are certainly some things that need to be um, uh, fact-checked and quality controlled. And we're going through that process now. And oftentimes, if you do a big undertaking like that with big data, people say, well, how do you know you're not putting garbage into the model and getting garbage out? Um, so we've done lots of um, lots of quality control checks on this, but they're still ongoing. So I don't think this is garbage in, garbage out, but um, do take things with a grain of salt, as it says says here. So that in that I don't think the patterns that I'm about to show you are going to change drastically, but I do think that some of the things I show you um, might change slightly in the coming months as we continue to to uh, check the data and make any corrections or additions as needed. So this is the data. We have new invasions on the y-axis as a function of decade. Um, and there were 90 species of scolatines that have invaded um, at least one country from the first uh, decade that we found, the first year that we have an invasion occurring, 1803, all the way up through 2020. Uh, we're ignoring data from 2020 onwards just due to lags in reporting and that the 2020 to 2030 decade is not finished. And we analyzed all of this data uh, at the decade level. So um, essentially ignoring the specific year within a decade that a detection occurred. And we did that because we, we sort of made the assumption that it's hard to know the exact year when something established. So I want to point out a few things about this graph. So you had, uh, looking at these invasions by scolatines, you have this initial wave of invasions that um, happens and starts to increase until there's these major global events that sort of uh, like shut down the closed up the world in terms of the exchange of international trade and the exchange of goods. And you see that they kind of plateau, uh, the invasions plateau for a few decades. And then um, as the world moves through those events and opens up a bit again, you get this giant wave of invasions from the 1960s onwards. So uh, it's kind of interesting to see this pattern show up in, in our data and in data that looked at or analyses that looked at plants and lots of other different groups of insects. Um, they found this very clear pattern where uh, they had these two waves of globalization that seemed to drive new invasions by insects and plants. And we see that very clearly, um, I think, in, in, in our data as well. The other thing I want to point out about this this graph is that um, this is another bit of good news, I suppose, uh, that we had this, this decline in 
in in new invasions in the last 20 to 30 years. And I think that uh, I attribute that to a few things. One is the increased sanitation of wood packaging material. Um, so this is um, just an, an ISPM 15 stamp. So things need to be, there's like over 80 participating countries now, they need to be either heat treated or chemically treated and debarked, which I think is um, thankfully reduced the number of invasions globally, um, at least by bark and wood boring insects. Um, it also could be that uh, there's some lag in reporting that we're missing, but I don't think that would change this overall declining pattern. And uh, an another option, which um, is certainly debatable, but that you have these insects that are potentially really good invaders and you have areas that are highly invasible and maybe you have the situation where sort of the lower hanging fruit are all taken care of so that the, the insects that are left over that haven't invaded are not as capable invaders or the areas that are remain to be invaded by certain species potentially have more um, uh, biotic resistance to new invasions. So they're just less able to be invaded for any number of reasons. So this is showing you the uh, number of species that have been uh, invaded a given country. So to walk you through this a bit, this is showing you that 26 or so species have in our data set have just invaded a single country. Um, a handful have invaded the 10, 20, 30 countries, and then you have a few that have invaded over 40. Um, so I'm just cherry picking a couple of species here, the, the top two invaders, Xylosandrus compactus, uh, Cracotripes carpophagus. So I don't expect that to mean a lot to anyone on the, the webinar necessarily, but um, for those that do love scolatines, our intention is to publish this data set eventually when we publish the paper. And so you're, you'll be able to go in and find your favorite scolatine if you want to look at the data and see how, how good of an invader they are. Um, so in terms of where they have invaded, uh, there's a few things that drive this picture. So the redder the country, the, the more non-native scolatines that have been reported from there. So one, of course, is uh, global trade. Hopefully, I've, I've sufficiently convinced you of that now. Uh, but a, a, another thing is uh, reporting bias. So you'll see things down here, like in, in Paraguay, that probably has uh, a few more uh, non-native scolatines, given it's, you know, the neighboring countries all seem to have a few more. So there is this, you know, an, an, an unfortunate, um, uh, an unfortunate situation in which, you know, not every country has like um, either the, the time, resources, or capacity to report these things. So I think you're seeing a place like the U.S. that has a lot of, um, you know, really good labs and people that work on um, scolatines and have the resources to do it, that you get increased reporting. Um, so hopefully that'll change with the future, uh, but the um, other thing I want to mention is that this is at a very coarse spatial resolution, so you have uh, places like Alaska that show up here because it's grouped with the U.S. that look heavily invaded, but actually most of the non-native species in the U.S., of course, are going to be in the, the continental part of the country, so um, just a few caveats on that. The, uh, so this is where things have invaded. In terms of where they've come from, um, this is the source country. So you're seeing uh, that uh, China, countries in Asia are going to be frequent sources for these uh, for in the invaders that are in our database. That makes sense when you think about international trade and and the similarity of um, parts of like the continental U.S., for example, um, the climate similarity with places in in southeastern Asia, uh, and. Uh, the, the caveats I want to mention about this map here is that we don't have perfect information on where the species actually originated from. So we've had to just group it based on where we know they are native to. So you'll see like Europe looks like lots of countries have been sources, but it's really that if a insect is native to Poland, it's probably native to Germany. So we have to kind of say that, that both those countries were a source in that case. So there's there's some inflated um, I guess, colors, I'll say, on this map in certain areas. So uh, I'm going to move into kind of the last um, the last result that I'm going to show you and the last analysis. Um, what we wanted to do was look at um, really what uh, drove this picture here. And we wanted to specifically look at the role of what are called bridgehead invasions. So when you think about biological invasions, they can kind of happen in, or you can break them up roughly into two categories. So um, if you think of these blue dots here as countries comprising the native range of a given species, 
they get introduced to a new location and they invade there. That I think if you know if someone was asked, could you describe how an invasion works? They would they would give you that example. So that's one option. Another option is that the species would invade subsequent countries um, by being introduced from the previously invaded range. So in this case, those would be called bridgehead effects, and this population would be called a bridgehead population. So we wanted to look at this potential process for driving the global invasion patterns of scolotines. So I'm just recreating the diagram I just showed you, where you have each dot can be thought of as a country, the blue ones will be the native range, and the orange ones will be uh, the introduced range or, or invaded range. And so uh, what we did is made this simplifying assumption in our analysis that we just said, okay, we're just gonna assume that species always had to come from their native range. And so when you're thinking about their ability to invade some uninvaded country, uh, we would take the inverse of the distances uh, to the native range, sum them up, and that would give us some measure of proximity. So essentially, if you're a country that's really, really close to the native range, you would have a really high value here. Um, then if that country became invaded and we moved forward another 10 years, um, we did this analysis all at the, the decadal time steps, which I'm, I'm gonna gloss over those finer details, um, but we would just we would totally ignore that this nearby country became invaded and say, well, we're just gonna look at the distance to the native range and assume that that's where the species came from. So as part of this process, we looked at like uh, the importance of climate matching, of imports from the native range, of human population density and potential recipient countries. So we looked at a ton of variables and we made again this assumption that invasions always happened by insects coming from their native range. The opposite of this um, would be this bridgehead effect. So things get introduced into some invaded area and then they're capable of invading subsequent places from that invaded area. So when we're calculating this, um, this distance-based variable, which I'll call proximity, we're assuming that the insects could have arrived in theory from those previously invaded regions or from the native range as well. So it could have come from either one. And again, in this case, we would sum up those uh, the inverse distances to all those previously occupied areas. So I'm gonna just refer to this top one is the native model and this bottom one is the occupied model. Um, and so I imagine that I uh, could have sufficiently confused some people with this description. So just to, to, to re-summarize that, in this model here, we're assuming that all the invasions we saw happened by a species becoming introduced from their native range, whereas in this occupied model, we're assuming that they could have come from their native range or from the previously invaded area. And so this is uh, this will be the, the final result that I show you. Um, the predictors in the model are on the y-axis. So this would be that, that distance-based variable that um, I just explained. And then we had human population density imports from the range, whether it was just the native range or the occupied range. So the native plus the invaded range and then climatic suitability. Um, and then on the x-axis, you have standardized slope coefficients. So uh, these bars here, are 95% confidence intervals. So how to think of them is if, if they include this dashed line at zero, it means they were not a statistically significant or statistically clear predictor. And these are standardized slope coefficients. So what that means for, um, um, for our purposes is that the further away these dots are from this dashed line, it means the stronger effect it had on invasion risk. And so uh, I'll walk you through kind of predictor by predictor. So this was a, a striking result here because what this is telling you is that um, invasion risk is lower for nearby countries, which when you think about, you know, something, an insect spreading from one area to the next, you'd expect nearby areas to be at the highest risk. Um, but I, what I think is driving this pattern is that um, I'm going to use Italy as an example. So if Italy became invaded by a given species from China, and then, uh, you know, Germany and Spain became invaded by this same species, and you just ignored that that could have happened by dispersal from Italy and said, well, we're going to assume it came from China again. You end up with these two regions, one becoming invaded in Europe over and over again, and China, 
um, that are really far apart. And so you're basically saying all these faraway countries are at high invasion risk, but you're ignoring the potential for that bridgehead effect. Um, so that would induce this negative correlation that we see here. So sort of the um, when we account for bridgeheads, we see more so what we would expect, that nearby countries are at greater risk of invading. So this is showing you that uh, that accounting for bridgeheads, accounting for the ability of an insect to invade from its previously invaded area is a major driver of scolotine invasions. At least that, that's what the evidence suggests. And so this, in terms of the, the practical implications of this, um, this is an indication that uh, not only do we need to be aware from a biosecurity perspective, and I would say we, we are, generally speaking, that this can happen, um, but that it really highlights the need for international cooperation to understand how you know, insects not only invade from their native range, but also from places that they have subsequently invaded. Um, so uh, moving down here, you have human population density was uh, not a strong predictor in either case. Um, we had imports in the native range only, so imports from the native range didn't appear to matter much when you're accounting for the fact that you can import from the invaded area for a given species. That really seems to, you get more imports from the invaded range, uh, you get a higher chance of invasion. Um, and that kind of speaks to what we know uh, generally about how biological invasions proceed. And this last um, result here in climatic suitability, this was sort of a, a result that surprised me when I first saw it because I, I mean, I knew climate matching and, and climate suitability would be important, but given it's the, you know, the furthest points away from this dashed line, it's actually indicating that this is the, the strongest predictor of invasions by scolotines. So uh, generally speaking, the more suitable a, a climate is, the greater chance of invasion risk, and that appears to be the most important for driving invasions in, in this case. I will mention the caveat that we didn't include host data in this analysis, which is going to be another major component of invasion risk. Um, and thankfully, that's also an area in terms of climate matching and, and risk mapping that um, a lot of uh, really talented people do a lot of work in and have for you know, a couple decades plus. So that's, a, you know, good news in that we're perhaps ahead of the curve on, on that one. Um, so our next step, I mentioned that this kind of last analysis is, is, is preliminary. Uh, we're still going through these databases, the one on the left by Thomas Atkinson, the one on the right by Anthony Cognato and Sarah Smith. Um, those are, they're really cool websites and databases if you're interested in, in scolatines and where they occur. Uh, and that kind of thing, I would recommend poking around on these. If you just kind of Google the 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 you know Barkin and Brosia beetles of America and Atkinson, you'll you'll find these pretty quickly. Um, so uh, to wrap up here, how does Ohio get so many non-native forest insects? I was kind of laughing and and putting this together a bit, and now being in Ohio, that um, you know some of the the more recent and perhaps some of the the scarier invaders have come. They were in Michigan first. Um, but of course, you know, going through all these slides, hopefully I convince you that um, it's not just due to them spilling over from neighboring states. Um, the oversimplified answer, but is that we import things from countries um, that have a similar climate to ours and trees that are related to the trees occurring in North America. And so I have occurring here in uh, italics uh, to highlight that not only is it a, a function of what our native trees are in North America and their relationship to other trees in other regions, but also that we plant a lot of uh, a lot of trees that are not native to the US um, and North America more broadly that then have facilitated a lot of invasions by um, insects that they you know would have had a co-evolved relationship with in their native range. Um, so uh, I'll just wanted to, to quickly thank funding from the uh, Mississippi State University where I was for a few years before, I was at Ohio State, um, the Czech University of Life Sciences in Prague, and then uh, startup funds from Ohio State University, and then uh, money from NSF and the Forest Service. And uh, if you have any uh, interest in the other work going on in our lab, uh, have a link to my lab webpage here. And uh, if, if you have any questions that I'm, I am unable to answer or don't sufficiently answer in, uh, that are posted in the chat, uh, certainly welcome to send me a note and I can do my best over email. Um, and, and thank you all for, for logging on for the webinar and I'll, I'll do my best to answer questions now. Awesome, Sam. Thank you very much. We do have, let me get, I was running around while you were 
talking because my mouse died. You never realize how much you need a battery in your mouse <laughs> till it won't work anymore. <laughs> it's like there's batteries here somewhere. I, I'm going to stop sharing. You think that's a that's fine. Okay. However you want to do that. Um, and I have to say that it's it's fascinating because you know um, early in my career at OSU. We were dealing with emerald ash borer. Of course, now we're dealing with spotted lanternfly. Um, you think back to gypsy moth and some of the other ones that we know how they moved here, like chestnut blight and some of those that the diseases. But um, that whole thing, if you think about it over those decades, has changed as transportation changes. So <clears throat> sometimes we're our own worst enemies, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, it's it's, uh, it's it's one of the things that's like, I guess, a paradox of being an invasion biologist is that you get excited uh, about invasions in some ways and how they work, but then it's also kind of depressing because yes, you get invasions. So yes, I do these talks, you know, for forestry programs and all these, and I I get to the end and it's kind of like, so you're really depressed now more so than maybe when you walked in because. These talks are depressing. <laughs> That's why I highlight the good news throughout of like, hey, look, yes. I know we've we had some problems, that. but <laughs> the phytosanitation seems to be helping by every indication. <laughs> right. we have, so that's a win. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. So Mariah asks, are all non-native species considered pests or only ones that cause damage? Yeah. So um, a few thoughts on that. One being that um, I started using pests broadly to just for ease of presentation, uh, especially when referring to the insects and pathogens, but there's certainly people that would say uh, pathogens can't be pests, um, which I, you know, I think has some, some justification to it in many ways. But um, I tend to, uh, my personal preference is to refer to, I, I, I probably slipped into saying invasive a bunch today, but I, I tend to prefer to say uh, non-native or and when I'm talking about invasions or invading, um, and, and that's because a lot of the sort of the standard I would say is that a, uh, a people refer to um, invasive species as non-native species that cause damage. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess my, I would, I think that's, a, a, I don't have like a big problem with that description. I think it's useful in many ways, but I, I sort of like to just use non-native as a broader term because I think there's probably a lot of, um, based on the justification, there's probably a lot of damage that we don't appreciate as humans that is going on to other organisms. And so it's, I sort of view them all as problematic in a, in a certain way. Sure. Um, so that's to say that, you know, depending on who you ask, not all non-native species are pests. And I, and when you talk about non-native species, I guess it, it, I, it would be, uh, I, I got to mention that, you know, when you think about um, imported natural enemies, um, so, you know, the four different parasitoids that have been uh, imported to combat emerald ash borer, you know, I, I would not describe those things as, as pests, but, you know, certainly beneficial insects that we intentionally imported. Um, so I hope that sufficiently answered your question. I think that that it's a conundrum, even on the plant side. I, we've recently to early tried to push because I'll have landowners say, well, you know, I was told that spice bush is invasive and I'm like, okay, time out it's aggressive. So we're trying to change how we use that verbiage and not that if we use the word invasive, it's attached to a non-native plant that is invasive versus our native plants that may be aggressive in their growth habits. Because then I get, if we don't, I get landowners who come to me and it's like, how do I kill all my spice bush? And I'm like, why would you want to kill all your spice bush? And, you know, you have to have those distinctions so i think it's great what you said with the pest because i think that's that also is part of this discussion and it's it's not easy there's just a lot of aspects to it yeah i think that a lot of times like people that do more true extension than than i do uh i think they find that useful for sort of highlighting that these things are really because invasive invokes a lot more than non-native i think right. so um, and I do think that the language invasive came from uh, plants originally. That and it's, and it, it kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about like actually covering and like blocking out light for other things and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not an easy 
easy thing to deal with. Um, so Joe asks, what are the wildland wildlife consequences of the Asian longhorn tick outbreak? The Asian longhorn tick outbreak? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, I don't, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I, so I don't do, uh, it's fun, it, I don't know if that person went to my lab webpage or anything, but I have a grad student that is working on factors shaping the spread rate of Asian longhorn tick, um, but I am not a, um, a med vet entomologist. So, um, and I don't know that uh, off the top of my head, I, I don't think I could tell you what kind of the documented confirmed problems mm -hmm. are in terms of impacts to wildlife health. But there's um, that student that is working on that is co-advised co by Risa Pesapain. So she yes. she had excellent resource and um, uh, would be a wonderful person to ask that question of. Yep. Uh, Carolyn asks, is there a decrease of inter is there a decrease of interceptions due to less inspections? Um, so I don't know how the inspection rates have changed recently, uh, but I know in the past with the de-emphasizing, uh, de excuse me, certain pathways that you did see a decrease in corresponding detections on that pathway. I think more recently you've, uh, with the, there have been um, really nice studies looking at like, like Bob, uh, Bob Hack has led a lot, if you're interested in reading the work, um, looking at changes in interception rates following the implementation of ISPM 15. And so I, I showed you some data on the establishments that seem like ISPM 15 is seemingly working in that regard. Uh, but with the, I would say the signal is there, but somewhat less strong than uh, maybe you would hope like in that, yes, there seems to be a, a clear decrease, but it doesn't like completely eliminate the the organisms from the pathway. Um, and there's a handful of reasons that we're, that's actually one thing my lab is, is starting work on in that you might have some organisms that survive the heat treatment schedule. Um, that uh, it's like 56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes that the wood needs to be treated to. So it's like maybe some survive it. And then the the other is that maybe there's, uh, it could be fraudulent applications of the, the ISPM 15 mark to wood packaging or really well-meaning people that just didn't have the machinery like the kiln or whatever it's uh, uh, sort of parameterized enough or didn't track the temperature at the truly coldest part of the chamber and there's some human error that goes into it. So, so I guess to answer your question, yeah, I think interceptions do go down when you inspect less, but I, I think the interceptions have gone down slightly in, in response to the phytosanitation measures. Okay. Anonymous asks, are there options for shipping slash wood pallet treatment that are not heat related? My relative works for a Bitcoin mining company and their equipment cannot be heat treated. They received a shipment recently filled with black widow spiders from Texas. Huh. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> I, uh, I there, I, I'm most familiar with the uh, phytosanitation practices for wood packaging material. So I don't know if those, uh, you know, if that would have been something that like the spiders would have hitchhiked on, but um, there are, at least for wood packaging, um, there's a couple different chemical treatments. One is methyl bromide, but I think that's a very active area of research because uh, methyl bromide has like ozone depleting properties. So they're trying to get away from that, thankfully. Um, but then of course it li limits, I think the other, um, you know, the, the, the options in terms of heat treating um, or uh, alternatives to heat treatment. Um, but I'll, I'll say that, there, that I'm not, I don't have all those details in terms of the, the non-heat treatment options, but they do exist. Okay. Uh, Carolyn asks, will we get a link to the slides of the presentation? So do you want to, we can put it where we put the recording. If you want to give us that, uh, uh, the set of slides, we can do that. If you're okay with that, just send them our way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that if I, I will try to remember when I'm uh, like, if there are several more questions, I'm there's a high potential I'll forget to send them over. So I'm happy to do that. But if I don't send them within like 30 minutes of us hanging up, just please remind me. Marnie's I'll send you, 
yeah, yeah I'll send you that like sends the video. Yep. Okay. And, and um, I'll I'll give you a little reminder. <laughs> that sounds good. I totally Thank understand. <laughs> totally understand. Is or is not ESBB a pest in the U.S.? I could not tell if you were only referring to European studies. Oh, so uh, Europe, it's typographist, European mm -hmm. space department. So um, yeah, it is not a pest in the U.S. and that it is not known to be established in the U.S. Um, so yeah, it's it has been intercepted a lot, but those are like either in wood packaging, avoid wood packaging, uh, but those, uh, and then the only time we've ever detected it outside of wood packaging material in the U.S. were those uh, I won't hold you to remembering a map from the presentation, but I had three yellow dots. Basically, there's been three times it's shown up in a trap, but they've never been found like colonizing a tree in the U.S. or anything like that, thankfully. So to the best of our knowledge, it's, it's hard to prove, you know, that something mm -hmm. is not here um, necessarily. But uh, it, to the best of our knowledge, it does not uh, it is not established in the, the United States or North America, period, thankfully. Okay. Uh, anonymous asks, can a thorough forensic investigation reveal on which shipment, boat, cargo, date, an invasive was introduced? If so, can the source shipment for spotted lanternfly and or emerald ash borer be identified? Is it illegal to introduce a non-native invasive? That's a weighty one, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I would say, I mean, I, I'm thinking on my feet a bit. Like I don't, I, I I couldn't, unless you were sort of, one, it's hard because you get, even with like, you start to look at the genetics of some of these invaders. I don't think, to my knowledge, I don't think this has been done with Emerald Ash Borer, but it could be multiple introduction events. Mm -hmm. Um like to refer back to Asian longhorn tick, I am familiar with that one. There, there appears to be at least three distinct introductions. And then it's hard to um, sort of walk that back to say, this is the one that led to the establishment. Mm -hmm. And so, because things like Ips typographus, you know, they get intercepted a lot. A lot of species that have established get intercepted a lot. So it's difficult to say it was this country or that one. What I, what I will say in terms of a deterrent, um, I think it depends on, uh, and it might have changed recently. These are also something that I'm kind of fuzzy on the details, so I'd, I'd take my answer with a bit of a grain of salt. But I don't. The the if you are a company that you know you say, all right, we're going to ship tile or something, and it arrives here, and you have an infested wood packaging material, and you're like an ISPM 15 compliant country, like in the U.S. that we are. Um, the uh, I think the fine can be up to the amount of the shipment. <laughs> um, so it can be like wow. a million, millions of dollars um, as a as a fine for the country that exported a um, that that exported a contaminated material. Um, and, I, and I will say that inspections are I think sometimes there's a maybe a misconception that they're like a true sort of, you know, we're by detecting them in the pathway, we're keeping them from getting into the country. And I think it's more so useful in that we detect them and people know we're looking uh, so that it's a deterrent that says, well, if we ship this, it could get, you know, they could find it and that could result in a really big fine. Because um, because as I said, we can only detect so many. But in terms of walking back an establishment into the, I mean, it's a, it's a, it'd be, to my knowledge, that'd be very challenging to figure out which exact shipment led to the initial invasion. And the inspectors have such a short window to inspect those cargo containers. I remember talking to an APHIS inspector who used to come around Cotman and you know he was talking literally minutes maybe in each cargo container before they have to let it be released to be moved off. They can't impede commerce so they have a, a very tight window and so you hope that they catch things but I mean we have to be realistic that there's probably not as much time as I'd like to have on each cargo container. Okay, so, oh, Carolyn also, uh, in a copy of the transcript, I think she means for the slides, and I don't know if you had any notes or anything, but you'll have the video of the presentation along with the slides, if that helps. Yeah, when, when, we post it and I'll probably get it posted later today. The transcript goes right along with it. And then even when we later on in a couple months put it on YouTube, there's also going to be 
a caption associated with that. Um, so Anonymous also asks, what is the source of all the interception data, APHIS in the US? Um, yes, for the, the interception data that I presented on it, um, I'm blanking on, I kind of mentioned this during the talk, I'm blanking on the exact um, year that APHIS was established, but they've been the ones that, to the best of my knowledge, certainly recently in the last 30 plus years, that have maintained the the right. interception data um, and and then shared that with my collaborators and I via a memorandum, memorandum of understanding. Uh, we have looked at uh, interception data for like uh, New Zealand, Canada. We did have some of that that I didn't present today that we looked at, um, but there are really cool papers uh, that look at the global flow of insects between lots of different countries looking at interception data. Um, hmm. So to answer your question, yes, I just showed interception data, the source of for the US, the source of that was USDA FIS. Before that, it was, um, I think, just generally USDA um, that was collecting yes. it and compiling it. But there's interception data that um, is that has been looked at for lots of different countries but then if you could imagine there's it's sort of and the reason we had to get a memorandum of understanding is that it can be sort of trade sensitive information that you know they don't want us to look and say hey you know this country is sending us all of these terrible insects or something because it can have <laughs> trade and policy implications so there are right. some countries that um, i'm told you know play their cards really close to their chest and are really hesitant to share any information about what gets intercepted sure um, Sandy asks, who is that grad hopper? I have one in my garden. Did you mean grasshopper? That's what I was. <laughs> yeah. Sandy, I think that's what you meant, but if not, let us know. Did you, I mean, did I miss I that? Remember, yeah. I don't, I don't remember, remember you talking about either. a grasshopper. If there's a picture. If, if it's box tree moth, take a picture of it and send it in. If that's ah, in your <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's what. Is that um, as close as I, I mean, I'm trying to roll through kind of the things you covered and I don't, I can't match. So Sandy, if you can help explain that a little better. Um, uh, so Carolyn then says, so what would this workshop look like from a researcher in China, for example? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to think on these, and I, I sort of have struggled with um, in writing some of these, uh, I guess this is maybe just being vulnerable for a second, in writing some of these things for 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 publication and stuff, because in, in some instances, if you're looking at historical data, you and you have interceptions from Yugoslavia or something, and then you need to sort of say, well, then we have more recent interceptions from the member countries now, like, will it be offensive to group these things into a single country, because that's the data that we have? Um, and then you also say, well, look, um, South America isn't as heavily invaded, but it's like, well, there's a sort of unfair socioeconomic reasons why, you know, we have a really great investment in research in the U.S. to, um, well, it's all relative, I guess, but to, to look at scolatines and document that information and have a, a nationwide trapping program in EDRR. So I do consider... Um, I guess I think about, you know, sort of saying, look, you put up a map and China appears very, uh, I guess, blue in terms of this source country for all these invasions. But I guess when you sort of zoom out and look at the the data, I, I think it's a clear, clear picture with a clear explanation of, you know, you have places that are exchanging a lot of goods that have very similar climates. And so I don't, um, and I hope that I didn't present it in any way that reflected poorly on, on, on China or anything like that, but it's just, this is where the insects have come from and here's why. Right. So I would hope they look at it and say, oh, um, I'm glad that, you know, we have better phytosanitation practices. And hopefully, you know, if you looked at invasions post 2020 and someone gave this talk in 30 years, you know, the map would look all the same color. But, <laughs> Well, and we send stuff to other countries. So it's not, I always try to emphasize that to folks that it's not just one way. We also send stuff um, overseas. And so we can be a culprit just like a China could be. Um, so Maria asks, or Maria asks, what constitutes a scolotine, a scolotine invasion of a country? me and my Latin. Is there a population or area threshold? 
Oh, that's a really, yeah, that's a really fascinating question. Um, so uh, for for us, it was, uh, is it uh, confirmed, basically reproducing in the country and documented by the people there that it was established? Um, to my knowledge, um, I'm trying to think if there's, I think the only, because we looked at this, because, you know, you can have species that get established that then get eradicated. I want to say in scolatides, there's only, um, I, and I would, if someone has a different answer to this, I, one, I'd love to know it, please post it in the, the chat. Um, but I, I don't think there's ever been a confirmed eradication from a country. I think the, the one I can think of was in a, like it was in a greenhouse setting that they eradicated it from that location in the greenhouses, which is very different from finding it on the landscape. But so to, an to answer your question more directly, we don't have a specific, um, you know, it needed to be reported consistently for this number of years, um, or that it needed to cover this area. Uh, but it was more so taking uh, what the initial report said about, um, you know, we found it established in, uh, in, you know, infesting plants in the landscape, like we wouldn't include where you found it in a couple of traps or something. Um, so that's why we would say, you know, Ips typographus is not in the US because we've just ever detected it in traps and that was 20 plus years ago. So it was really just taking what the initial report or the report we used said about um, whether the species was established at a given location. Okay. Uh, Janice asks, do we know what the pathway was for beech leaf disease arrival? And will knowing the pathway help us in eradicating this pest? Oh yeah, I don't, I don't think we. Um, well, someone can chime in if they. Again, this is I'm I'm sort of speculating on some of these things, and my my interest is getting accurate information across to people. So I don't <laughs> I don't want to say something too wrong, but I don't. To my knowledge, do we know exactly where it even came from? Um, I don't I think mean, so. I, yeah, so if it did come internationally, I mean the the historical data on pathogens would suggest that it likely came on the importation of a live plant um, or plant material. Mm -hmm. uh, in theory, it could have come in on wood packaging potentially, but um, I would think for something like beech leaf disease, it was not on wood packaging and came, right. came to be a live plant if it was imported. It's the the nematode that they're looking at, um, trying to uh, figure okay. out the what role it plays. Um, in the process. And so, you know, it's like, it's a new nematode for the folks that have been looking at it, but we still have a lot more to learn. I think we just don't have all the answers yet that we'd like to have for beech leaf disease. Someone posted, uh, Mary Mason posted in the chat, it's a subspecies of a Japanese nematode species. Yep. And, and that's all that's really established. Thank yep. you. Yep. Um, Thanks, Mary. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I would say in terms of the eradication, there's, um. There's work looking at a, a, a drivers of successful eradication, and a major determinant of it is the area that's invaded. And since beech leaf disease is across such a wide region now, I would say the chances of eliminating that are essential. I won't say completely zero, but near yeah. zero, unfortunately. Uh, and then Phil asks, uh, fall webworm is an invasive insect in China. So we may have given it to them. And yes, I do think, don't they call it American? I think they call it American yeah. white moth. Something like that. Something like that. Um, is that the one that, so I, I know there is one that yes, we can document that it was our fault. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I, the Dendroctinus valens, I think is another, uh, which would be a scolatine. Um, I want to say it's, again, that's another thing. I, I don't think it was Terebrand. I think it's Valens. Yeah, that um, we, we sent to China where it's, it's a, um, a, a much more problematic over there than it is um, yeah. here where it's native. So yeah, there's certainly circumstances. We, the, the U.S. has done its fair share of not only just sending things to China, it's just a part of engaging in international trade. I think yeah. any country that has is probably contributed to the, the problem. <laughs> I know when I was doing research on a, a, a presentation on oaks, I discovered that someone had taken our northern red oak to Poland and planted it. And now it's an invasive species over there because it's out producing all of their native oaks. And so it's like, oops. <laughs> 
you know, there's that example of a plant that somebody thought would solve a problem and took it overseas and ended up being more of a problem than solving a problem. But I think a similar thing has happened with uh, black locust in, in Europe and that um, the, and I guess, depending on who you talk to, my understanding is that it's either like a beloved ornamental plant or an invasive plant, but <laughs> you've had that tree kind of become invasive in certain circumstances that's then facilitated the arrival of um, a few different North American insects that have invaded Europe on mm -hmm. that plant. So. And yet, Marnie, I don't remember which squirrel it is, but there's a squirrel that got taken from the US to the UK. And now is they've got all these wanted posters for the squirrel because it's just obliterating things. Um, yeah, we have our fair share of uh, sending yeah. things over yeah. there. We're not, not, not innocent either. We're not innocent <laughs> in that aspect of all of this stuff. So, um, so I think, let's see, Carolyn had asked what about what we send. So we've kind of talked about that. Um, Sandy said it was the picture you showed, which I, I almost think that might still be the boxwood um, moth. Uh, so let's see. And I there think you more that just came in. Oh, yes. I thought <laughs> it was at the bottom of the head. Yeah, we were. And then <laughs> in. Um, so anonymous asks with the need for international cooperation in the inherent issues of human drawn maps versus geolocation science-based boundaries. This is a very North America centric perspective with a question mark. Um, so, uh, I guess to unpack that a little bit, uh, so, I mean, one thing to say is that, you know, certainly the, in, the in invasions are not going to res respect borders in any way. Um, you know, the, so that's a one thing that if something was to invade Canada, um, we certainly need to be concerned about it, um, uh, spreading South, but, uh, I think that that's, I, I kind of tried to speak to in terms of when I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, drawn borders that, you know, are certainly disputed by in many cases, the people that they were drawn for. Um, I'm not gonna veer into that too much, but that's something I try to be sensitive about when I'm sort of presenting this stuff in written form and um, being considerate of how someone might feel if I, you know, like group Czechoslovakia back into Czechoslovakia versus the um, Czech Republic and Slovakia and those sorts of things. So, um, uh, yeah, so I don't, I mean, I, I think that it's a, a I, I think that, you know, a, a lot of the, the people that are on like the Ips Typographis uh, paper where uh, scientists from uh, Japan, scientists from Switzerland, the Czech Republic. Um, so I would hope that they were doing an, an okay job of sort of um, having a more global perspective than a North American centric one, but um, maybe I fall short in some ways. But um, but yeah, so I don't I, I don't know if that answers your question exactly. But I, I I just sort of wanted to speak to some of the things that I consider when I'm presenting, or whether it's in written form or orally about these things. But so the we got a couple more. Um, Anonymous says I'm puzzled why Wayne County in Ohio would lead the state in importing insects. No airports or other sources for imports there. I was kind of puzzled by that too, but I also wonder is it that that county has just been better at reporting things than so maybe other counties have. Oh, that's good it certainly could be a reporting thing, but to make the distinction, I, um, if I didn't clarify this, I'll, I'll do it now that that map is not, um, uh, it's not like a, it's, it is established species, but it's not where they first arrived necessarily. Um, so yeah, for some of those species, they would have had to, um, you know, jump over certain counties to get there. Um, but it could be, and I don't know enough about the exact landscape and forest types in Ohio that are in that, you know, in that specific county versus another one. Um, I would imagine that there's not many like unique tree species to that county relative to the surrounding ones. Right. Um, but that could drive it too. But I think if you're if you're if you're thinking about um, yeah, if you're thinking about like survey efforts and that kind of thing, it's and you're probably are talking about just a reporting bias versus a um, mm -hmm. import 
um, extra well, imports that go into that county versus the surrounding ones. So Wayne County is where OARDC is or the research hub where Kayla's office is. So that could play into it as well because you've got ATI and the research center there in Worcester. Um, so that probably plays a part in it as well because there's a lot of OSU land around there that um, looks at a lot of different things. So that could play that part. Yeah, no, that make, yeah, that's a really good point. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I just saw Kayla's name pop up in the chat. So that reminded me that she's sitting in Worcester, <laughs> which puts her in Wayne County. Um, so let's see, Sandy says it's not the moth. It was a real grasshopper in a picture about three quarters of the way through the presentation, brown and green. Now we're all very curious. Yeah. <laughs> Here's this grasshopper picture. Now what is this, Sam? Come on. <laughs> He's searching. Yeah, I just figure I can take a look. Oh, and Kayla adds for the Wayne County thing in College of Worcester. I had forgotten about that. So yes, you do yeah, have some black on there. there that probably add to that. <clears throat> I don't necessarily remember. So yeah, I'd had box tree moth, um, spotted lantern fly, elm zigzag sawfly, a few scolatine species, so beetles, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid. But I mean, if, if there's a, once the slide deck is posted, um, yeah. Then uh, I think Sandy was the individual's yes. name. Uh, if, if you scroll through the slide deck and find the slide number um, and you want to email me, I'm happy to provide any insights on that. Okay. And then Mariah asks, how much time do you spend observing slash studying living bugs versus scouring data in your research? Yeah, it's really, uh, in terms of things varying through time, uh, that has varied a lot through time. Nowadays, I kind of do a very little of all of it because I'm <laughs> writing grant proposals and um, and that kind of thing and trying to get my lab up and running. But, um, you know, as a grad student, it was mostly field work and hands-on work with insects. And then as I moved into my postdoc and started working with um, Sandy Leopold and Song Lin Fei, um, Song Lin's lab is actually the one that's kind of helping uh, I guess, modernize that um, alien forest pest explorer database that I showed at the, the beginning of the mm -hmm. talk. But they do a lot of like macro scale ecology and continental dynamics, intercontinental dynamics of invasions and stuff. So that's kind of when I got into the big data world was a few years ago. Um, and now my lab has a blend of uh, hands-on fieldwork stuff um, with a mix of doing big data, um, scouring the internet, uh, integrating sort of different different existing databases and that kind of thing. So it's a mix. The last time I like got to actually do a study with a, an insect was when I was at Mississippi a couple of years ago and we looked at um, basically the walking dispersal of capacity of crape myrtle bark scale, which is another yeah. non-native insect that um, feeds on crape myrtles, which I don't think we have a ton of in Ohio, but maybe that'll change in the in the coming decades, <laughs> but um, we'll see. So. Okay. And then Janice says, do you partner with the researchers who are working with the Sentinel tree program? Um, I have not yet. So to, to my knowledge at Ohio State, that would be um, Enrico Bonello. I'm, not, I'm yes. not sure if there's others that are involved at OSU with that. Apologies I think Enrico is the main, main person because he did a, a webinar for us on the Sentinel tree program. Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, that's like, uh, yeah, I think that's really exciting, really useful work, but I've not um, uh, not involved with it at all. Yeah, I made him do the presentation because I was the one getting the questions about what are all these little things that you're setting up all over campus? I thought I should know being the forester and I'm like, I don't know what somebody's doing. And of course it was Enrico. So we had him do a webinar so folks could learn more about the Sentinel Tree Program. I think that's a fascinating they're in Chadwick, right? Like, right. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I yeah. saw them on my, uh, when I interviewed here, I got to, and they were like fenced off and I, yes. but, um, <laughs> yeah, but everyone seemed to think that Kathy should have those answers since, you know, the forester in her title 
I was like, hey, it's not me, <laughs> but we found who it was. So I think we're done with questions, Sam. Um, thank you so much. Thank this you so awesome. much. Um, right. I can think of a few other folks that may be calling because they'll like this kind of talk. We were just talking with some Christmas tree growers about having a talk similar to this. And so um, you may get some additional calls. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's um, hopefully it was informative, but it's also nice just to, you know, being new here at OSU to sort of introduce myself and um, share some of the stuff we're working on. And of course, if there's people that are interested in working